Center on as a service offerings brought to you by Insight. I'm Jessica Ostring, Marketing Specialist here at Insight, and will be your moderator today. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. This webcast is designed to be interactive between you and the presenters. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize and move any of the windows that you have open. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom and submit your question. All questions from this webcast will be captured. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the question mark icon below the presentation window. The help guide covers common technical issues. I would now like to turn over the presentation to our presenters, Kent Christensen, Phil Okonski, and Chris Kapusta. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Jessica. And I want to thank everybody for taking a few minutes out to um, look at what we're going to discuss today. This is really not intended to sell anything specific. Um, our goal is to educate you. Um, we think there's a significant shift going on in the industry. Um, and where we are having this conversation with many of our clients to understand there's a new option of, of how to consume infrastructure and run applications. And really the goal is to say, make you aware that it exists, that we understand it extremely well. We'd love to help you through it. And see if it fits into your business plan and your planning. So with me um, is Phil Okonski, who's Director of Engineering Services, but very integral to how we deliver this as a managed service um, to the client. And Chris Capusta, who is a uh, senior manager in our practice, um, focused a lot on storage. And the topic is, is kind of started off with storage as a service, but as we'll get through this, you'll see that, that, that it's expanding. So um, just a very, very brief commercial of Insight. Um, obviously, those who know us know that we do a lot of different things around expertise and different services. And from there, that's all we'll really talk about Insight. Um, but you'll get information on, uh, at the end if you need to understand more about the client. So what's going on in the industry? Um, if we remember the old normal, 2019, Gartner came out and made a bold prediction that was what was less than 1% of the market, people buying things as a service. And there's different terms, pay for what you use, as a service, et cetera. They predicted, this is before COVID, of course, it would be 15%. Well, that's pretty significant because at the time, 22% of workloads were in public cloud. So 15% of all data center infrastructure would be a very significant move um, and that was the prediction. As we got into 2020 and all the changes, it went up to maybe 20%. Now they're, you know, in March, and now apparently a new um, update. They're saying 40% of all on-premise IT storage and 70% of enterprise-grade storage, 40% um, of all capacity of any infrastructure will consider this model. Now, why would that shift happen so fast? And that's over the next few years. Why would that happen so fast? I think they finally came out and just said it. Nobody really likes CapEx. They don't like the stress of making a big capital decision. They don't like the planning involved, the uncertainty of the planning, whether it's just planning for three or four years or planning in alignment to a cloud strategy. Um, they don't like the fact that there many, many clients are forced with decisions because of end of support or end of life or infrastructure that needs attention, whether it's security or just it won't be supported so it's more risky. Um, it was always thought of, of that, that you know, baggage, if you would, was a, a barrier to innovation, and the whole CapEx model is a throttle to innovation. So, these are the reasons, and we're seeing that as some of the primary drivers for people saying, I'm really interested in this model. Now, one of the things that we noticed is that um, while most of the clients we're working with, they're very sophisticated organizations, and it's not as simple as I either buy a bunch of CapEx things and run a data center or I go to public cloud. But it, at, the, at the highest level, those are the big decisions. We are going to public cloud, and we're going there aggressively um, in a calculated way, whatever it is, but we're running a data center, which means I have to deal with the operational and the CapEx, et cetera. And now what we're finding is this model is giving this option. We're getting, giving some examples that says, wait a minute, this is a complement to these. It could be considered a bridge between them. 
it is comparable. It's hard to compare CapEx data center costs with cloud costs, but it is much easier to understand that if I put something on an on-ramp to cloud, or in some cases an off-ramp to cloud, or adjacent to cloud in a true hybrid, that it's much easier to conceptualize that hybrid is where I'm going to end up. And so it is really opening up the, the planning and decision-making of our clients to say, ah, this makes sense, and it can be either uh, a substantial amount or a very, very substantial amount of my planning moving forward. So um, it makes sense to just stop for a second and say, well, wait a minute. Are you just doing a lease? A common question, and we're going to try to address the questions, right? So in the world of CapEx, uh, the analogy I use, it's, it's like if I'm going to build a house, somebody very thoughtfully says, all the planning I have says I should build this house, you should have three rooms, a kitchen, you know, two bathrooms, blah, blah, blah. blah. And then um, I'm trying to foresee uh, events coming forward. Are we going to have children? Are the you know, mother-in-law going to move in, et cetera? Uh, but once you make a major capital purchase for that house or that infrastructure, you kind of own it, you take care of it, and significant changes to it are much more difficult because it's kind of yours. In the lease model or the OPEX model, everything about – the farmer decision and the planning and, and the rigidity still applies. You're just paying differently. And FASB says, and you're going to still take it as a capital expense. So cloud consumption is completely different. Um, completely different in that I don't have to plan for the outcome. I don't have to pay until I use it. I pay for what I use. I have more flexibility. So it's really appealing. Um, however, you know, in some cases it can be incredibly expensive. Uh, compared to running a data center, and, and most clients have done some of that and said, you know, the flexibility is worth the cost, especially if I'm trying to do something incredibly innovative. And as a service is really bridging that gap, saying, well, what if you could, you know, procure infrastructure that was on a cloud consumption model, pay for what you use, um, have more flexibility, have it not be a CapEx, but a lead, you know, a, but more of a on operational expense, um, would that change your planning? So um, we've been doing this for a while. Um, <clears throat> the storage guys were first because it's expensive and it's complicated and people all, all had to overbuy storage, et cetera. Um, but now kind of everybody's in there. And so, you know, with 18 to 20 months under our belts of doing this, you know, why are people doing it? Well, if you were in the transportation and hospitality industry last year, for example, it might be a financial decision. I don't want to use all my capital. Oil and gas, there's other people that have just decided, I don't want to use capital up front. It's, it's just a different way of thinking about it. So whether it's, you know, I'm trying to preserve capital or I'm just changing the way I look at it, some people look at it purely as a financial model and say, is this better for me financially? Um, however, that is, ironically, the minority of how people are deciding. Many organizations are using this as a bridge to cloud. We're going to go to cloud. Um, you know, we have a target, but we don't know with certainty how we're going to get there or how fast. And so instead of, you know, um, you know, selling all the furniture before you move out of your, or, of your data center, you can start to say, well, I'm just going to put it on this bridge and eventually it could go to cloud or it could stay, depending on how the planning goes. And it gives me a lot more flexibility to execute a cloud strategy. So it's very common that it is in a bridge to cloud strategy. And the other, ironically, is even if organizations that have no intention of using public cloud say this reduces my risk in planning. So I would have to, in the case of storage, plan maybe annually, uh, plan for four years, plan for the highest watermark, make sure there's a little extra, until so you were overbuying and it was a difficult planning. And what we're finding is this is taking um, the risk out of all of these strategies, the financial risk, the cloud risk, and the planning risk. We're, we're giving the opportunity to reduce risk. So with that, um, I want to hand it over to Phil and have him go deeper into some of the offerings and, and how they compare from the different partners. Thanks, Kent. Yeah, we've been, we've been doing as-a-service type offering for, for many, many years. Uh, but you know, as Kent mentioned, the, the 
the FASI rules uh, change it both for clients as well as service providers like us. Uh, and, and so what we've really seen is, is a couple key aspects of the as a service sort of play out over time. One is what I'd call service, what we call service based pricing. And really that's, you know, translating the, the infrastructure and, and assets into consumption type of metrics. You know, think terabytes, think CPUs, um, you know, that, that really drive your workflow or excuse me, your workloads, uh, into the business. Uh, and, and very similar to what the cloud has. Uh, storage has done this primarily, typically on terabytes. Uh, and the whole idea is, is driving, you know, to specific rules. And, and each program has, does it a little differently. But the whole idea is to, is to drive a minimum configuration, a minimum, a minimum consumption, uh, and to, but also be, give you that flexibility to move it up and down based on utilization. The second is, is really designed for what I'd call architected workloads. Um, that where you, you know you need a configuration for a, a workload or a set of workloads, um, and you know you need those type of configurations, and you need it for you know not only for you know a production workload, but possibly disaster recovery, but also need it managed, you know security and, and other services attached to it. So you have a configuration, and then the, the ability to translate that into a consumption model um, is it, it can be really challenging. Uh, but there are programs so that Insight, as well as our partners, provide that can really translate that into a consumption model uh, so that, again, clients can consume that type of configuration-based uh, approach uh, as, as a service uh, compared to you know, a, a, an OPEX lease um, that has been done typically in the past uh, to as what Ken said is typically translated by uh, finance through basic rules with a CapEx. So that, um, you know, we see our partners, you know, coming at it with a lot of different approaches. Um, and, and, and all programs have their slightly different approaches to how these models work. And so understanding them and understanding how they measure the consumption, uh, how does that affect your workloads, how does that affect um, how you consume the cloud, uh, it, it can be challenging. And, and most, ti most times, our clients are coming to us and going, I don't, you know, I don't that's just need storage. I just don't need network. I don't just need compute or backup or data protection. I need, I need it all uh, in some way, shape, or form. And so, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it, whether you mix and match service-based pricing, whether, you know, that you see on the left there, whether you use a configuration-based pricing approach um, or, or what Insight can provide is, you know, sort of a mix and match type of approach of how you want to do it. Um, we, we navigate those type of options for our clients uh, all the time uh, and help them understand what is the, 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 you know, to meet the business and technical requirements that drive an architected solution, that drive the workloads that clients are trying to support through a consumption-based model, and then map those to the right architectures and programs that our partners provide, and all of them have great solutions and, and great capabilities to really drive that. Now, on, on top of that, you know, part of what has to happen with these platforms is really, um, you know, how do, you know, once these platforms are engaged, how do you maintain it? Uh, you know, you have to obviously drive the, you know, understand how, how they're supported, what are their support models, who's supporting them, how do you glue all those support models together, especially if there's multiple um, uh, service or configuration models, yeah, how do you how do you drive the um, drive the partnerships around that? Especially, uh, you can even include things like you know colo or hosting providers or or other type of service uh, service elements on top of that platform, and and that's exactly what our clients are searching for. It's not just executing the program, but really driving that whole life cycle from beginning to end. You know, and and these offerings really tend to mirror what we typically see in the hyperscalers. Uh, and that's, you know, from a standpoint, and that helps give a really good comparison of, you know, what you can get from, you know, the, the hyperscalers and what you can get from our partner program. Typically, we see, you know, depending on the workloads, we can see similar prices. Sometimes they're lower, sometimes they're higher. It really drives out, you know, what, what you're trying to do, and we walk through that. And, and having insight being part of not only, you know, partners, you know, that you've seen before, but also having extensive in, 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 uh, uh, expertise in the public cloud, uh, you know, we're able to help clients, again, navigate that comparison as well. 
Um, and when it comes to then that aspect of managing those workloads, uh, whether it's in the public cloud, whether it's integrated with the public cloud, or whether it's a, it's driven into a dedicated infrastructure, either in our clients' data centers or, or their, their colos or, or an insight data center, all of those options are on the table and give the clients a lot of flexibility of how they want to manage their, their infrastructure over time. Um, again, we walk you through a lot of different aspects of, of term and, and the contractual aspects, uh, the variables that are needed um, to, to consume the service, uh, and how you drive that over time. Now, one of the things that a lot of clients are coming to us for is that, you know, it, you, you've probably heard um, at, at the industry and, and all companies, including Insight, are dealing with it, is, is the great resignation uh, that's going on. Uh, resources are, uh, you know, are in high demand at this time uh, at, in this industry, probably yet we haven't seen in a very long time. Uh, and so you know, a lot of clients are coming to us and going, you know, I, I can take these architectures, I can take these infrastructures and put them either in the cloud or in our data centers, uh, but at the end point, you know, it's, it goes beyond that into the full life cycle of, I'm going to consume these, these uh, solutions over many years, and how do I op support it, how do I manage it, and how, and, and how do I optimize it? And that's a, that's a huge challenge for clients who are struggling with you know, finding the talent, let alone the, having the, the time and energy around the processes and tools to, to drive that, uh, to enable that talent uh, to execute and operate these environments successfully. Uh, you know, most of our clients are coming to us and saying, we need to really assess, you know, our resources, our finite resources need to be closer to the business, need to understand our business and how to translate that into, um, into technical and business requirements for this. And, and look at how do I get out of, you know, watching 24-7 uh, the operations of this. And so typically what we've seen and clients are asking for is, you know, a, a really diverse support model from, from the, the base of, you know, you know, clients may say, you know what, I want to manage it myself. I have some, some resources to do that. I just need a really strong support model, and that's where the essential services comes in, to really driving the full aspect of how am I going to monitor it, how am I going to fix it, how am I going to change it, how I'm going to patch it and, and make and, and make it make that platform secure. Uh, how do I, you know, some some clients are even some sense of how do I extend that into uh, the OS, into the workload support? Uh, how do I protect it from a data perspective? How do I um, drive disaster recovery? And then finally, how do I optimize it? Uh, how do I optimize it not only through regular capacity performance and and really the translation from capacity and performance into consumption management? You know, I you know the you, you buy it. You buy an asset for three to five years. You're trying to maximize the capacity. A consumption service is how do I ma make sure I am maximizing the consumption, and 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 really maximizing that consumption could mean how do I lower the consumption to make sure I'm using it smartly. You know that you know that uh, you know I'm turning off the correct workloads. I'm I'm using the right tiers of service. All of those types of discussions have to happen over time and over the life cycle of the service, and so that's where our, you know, our engineers, our architects, our operation, operational people, as well as our client success team, you know, sit down with our clients, make sure not only is the platform running, you know, it's, you know, it's patched and, and has up to the level to drive a lower risk, but also sit down and talk about those consumption uh, components, especially from all the different types of models that clients typically consume, walk them through that and help provide an analysis and recommendations of how do I make sure that I'm making the right decisions for my business as well as my architecture to make sure that um, I'm maximizing the value uh, while minimizing the cost uh, and, and, and getting the service levels that I need from a, for, for clients. And that's really where we, we spend a significant amount of time, and that's that, that center area between all these programs and all these technologies, you know, being able to sit down with our clients and go, okay, help us help them navigate it, uh, and, and drive that. And whether you use Insight or someone else, you're going to want to seek a partner that can help glue all these pieces together uh, as a partner uh, with the right operational, architectural, and engineering type of discussions uh, to really make sure that uh, these, these solutions that uh, are continuing to, um, to grow and mature in the marketplace uh, are, are the right for, for your organization and your workloads. So with that, Ken, I'll, I'll hand it back off to you. Awesome. Thanks, Phil. 
so let's drill down a little bit, and then we'll give you some examples. Um, I'll talk a little bit about storage as a service, because this is really where it all started. Um, you know, the storage providers, like NetApp and Pure, and some others, Adachi, Zadara, um, all started by saying, hey, I got an as a service offering because it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, it's pretty easy to look at storage and say storage is lower cost when it's in a hosted or your data center than it is for cloud, especially for high-end storage. Um, that's a pretty easy comparison that, it, that, that, that we've kind of known. Um, and so storage is kind of where it started, and as, as Phil has pointed out, we've seen it expand to, you know, I under, need to understand my compute and my uh, networking needs and, and my security needs and my data protection needs. So the basic concept of storage as a service, um, there are rate cards. These are a couple of examples. Um, typically, they're starting to be on their website. So people who bought enterprise storage probably we didn't know. I get the price before the sales guy shows up. Um, but that's new, transparent pricing. It aligns it to your needs. We typically will go in and say, well, how are you using it today? You don't need to even own everything you own if you've over-provisioned or plan for everything you might use. Um, and so we help get them aligned to it. Uh, it is not a CapEx. Um, typically, you say, okay, I need, let's say, 100 terabytes. Um, we give you 120 or more just to make sure you have enough. Um, keep ahead of that, um, you know, help you, give you a consistent rate to grow. Um, it's common when people do this that they say, okay, you know, I want to make a backup copy to cloud. Maybe I'll do DR to cloud. Maybe I'll integrate that with some cloud services. Uh, it's very common when people start going to storage as a service to say, let's make sure I have my, um, you know, uh, secure um, you know, anti-virus uh, uh, planning so I don't have ransomware issues, um, you know, build my air gaps in, things like that. Again, the transparent rates. Um, storage, the, the providers of storage services um, typically are taking more risk. You and the client will see that. Um, boy, this, is, this seems to be a really good deal. They sent, they sent me a lot of stuff, and I'm only paying for it slowly. Um, and that's because storage is, you know, probably higher margin for people who sell it and probably more valuable to you. Once your data's on there, you know, it's not transient like a compute or memory might be. Uh, the compute providers came on next, even some of the OEMs, their compute offerings came next. Um, they typically aren't one-year contracts like storage. They typically start at three because uh, compute is, is probably not as high a margin for them. Um, and is considered a little bit more transient and a little bit more competitive um, in, the, in the world. So um, they tend to start at three-year or five-year contracts um, and, and are measured either by memory um, or by server node or, or things like that. And then we're seeing networking start to aggressively where, you know, is it per switch, is it per port, or in the case of SASE, is it per access user, um, and so we're seeing all these programs start to build and expand. So what we wanted to do is take a couple of examples. Um, and the goal here is, is, again, if something sounds like the way you're thinking, then we can drill in to say, does it make sense? So, you know, a couple of, of typical examples that are representative. So in one case, an organization that was in the financial industry, and they made a pretty public statement that we are aggressively transforming and going toward a cloud strategy. Um, and so the whole organization is aligned behind that objective. And part of that means that, that if you used to sell me things, CapEx uh, or storage or something, that's not going to be easy to get through in this environment because that requires long-term planning. And there's obviously a lot of transition going on here. Um, however, you know, like most organizations, there's some technical debt and risk we want to uh, uh, eliminate, et cetera. And so the concept of an as a service program started to make sense. Um, you know, organizations, and, and there's dozens that are aggressively mo moving toward cloud, but whether they're re writing applications, and that's going to take maybe a few years, or just the process of figuring out what should go when. Uh, is going to take some time. This made sense as a strategy to say, well, I can put it here. I know it's going to be here for about a year, and then I'll just go to month to month and, until I need to move over. And again, like other organizations, 
um, they can now say, oh, okay, well, if it's, you know, $70 a terabyte here, and I realize that that same level of service on cloud might be 250 or more, um, you know, that may change how I plan to move things. Um, but at the same time, it gives you that flexibility. So like many organizations, um, they start to say, okay, you know, what are we going to do with Q compute? What are we going to do with backup, et cetera, et cetera. Another example um, is actually something that we actually started building in and saying, okay, now that people are, are looking at this, and this isn't cloud bashing, it's cloud alignment. Um, in, in this case, a service provider. And the reason this is really beneficial for a service provider is because the service provider who is providing services, and many organizations consider whether it's internal or external customers for providing services, it aligns perfectly. If we give you a standard level of service versus a premium level of a service versus a, a best level of, a, of service, you can actually provide that to your clients as those levels. And you don't have to buy hardware and manage service levels on that. So it made sense for a lot of reasons. At the same time, this organization had a lot of aging equipment and had to make some big decisions. Do I go to cloud? Do I rebuy everything? Um, do I have somebody just outsource the whole management of this operation, et cetera? Um, and in this case, what we did was we helped them understand what they had. And, and in this case, it was 3,000-something workloads. And we said, okay, you know, we, we can predict what cloud would cost um, now that we're sitting here talking about it. We think, you know, it would cost you in a quarter of, you know, in the order of a half million dollars a, year, uh, a month, $500,000 a month. Uh, a cloud provider was there. And actually said, you know, it would be a little north of that, maybe 540000 a month to put it on cloud, um, but it will all be great. And so we went in and built an as a service, which, of course, now I have to get beyond storage. I have to include uh, compute. I have to include storage. I have to include data protection. I want hosting, et cetera. Um, and we came up with a model and said, okay, well, that ends up to be, you know, around one hundred eighty k a year. Uh, so needless to say, the difference between $500,000 a year and 180 k a year in, in real dollars, I mean, an outlay um, is significant. And so they have made the choice that, that now it's just a matter of where we put it and how fast we, we architect it. But that was allowing them to make that comparison. Um, and, and really what was interesting is, is that now we're able to go to clients and, you know, kind of proactively say, look, you know, based on what a VM is, right? We we know what it is. We we've, we've got you know hundreds of clients and millions of VMs, and we averaged them. And we said we think we can run those for nine cents an hour, or VDI at four cents an hour, or a database at eleven cents an hour. And in their case, it was a little under eight cents an hour. And it's now a direct comparison. It's not saying I got to operate a data center and buy a bunch of capex versus this this you know kind of obscure cloud thing that I won't really understand the billing until I get there. Um, we're able to actually proactively say, well, here's, here's the difference in the, in the cost. And in some cases, you know, if I'm doing something incredibly innovative, uh, cloud makes a tremendous amount of sense. But sometimes when I'm lifting and shifting things like VMs and VDI and database, uh, it's a little harder. Um, and it actually extended in, in the case of, um, and I didn't realize this was a lot, of, of an organization that, that um, is, is pretty public. Yeah, everybody knows the name. It, it is a financial type organization. They were so advanced in their cloud strategy that they actually um, were in the cloud with well over 10,000 workloads. And they knew it was costing them, which was tens of millions of dollars a year. And they realized that this is costing a lot more than it did before. Um, and, and, you know, being public and, and expenses under scrutiny, um, they're trying to figure out, you know, what the next step is. And they, they'd already come to the conclusion that I'm probably going to bring a lot of that back. And it happened to be running, you know, basically VMware on VMware Public Cloud on AWS, et cetera. And we went to them and said, look, you know, again, here's some, we're from calculations, what your stuff looks like. And, um, you know, we can run this between six and seven cents a VM. Um, you know, I don't know the specific numbers, but given the intensity of which they're rolling the project out, I'm guessing it's, it's three um, to maybe four times as much to run it in public cloud. Um, and so this is a project where 
Um, you know, given the size and complexity of the organization, it is going incredibly fast. Um, ultimately, you can start doing calculations of, you know, I've got a thousand workloads. Every time I bring it back, I save 50%, 60%, 70%, whatever that number is. Um, and the ROI on that is, you know, pretty much as fast as I can do it, it pays for itself. Um, so those are a couple of examples. There's all kinds of, uh, of different examples. I think one of the things that's, that's very common um, for organizations have been doing this, and, and by the way, dozens of organizations have, have started on this journey, and zero have said that didn't work out well or not expanded or not renewed or not grown it. Um, so, it, it, you know, the, the purpose of this was to give you some introduction to the concept give you some abilities to say, how would this change my planning? Uh, whether it's cloud planning, infrastructure planning, transformation planning, th is this something I should consider? And if so, you know, can we help you uh, go through that? Um, so with that, there, there's a, a QR code to get some more information. There's a couple of things, but um, we wanted to open it up for questions. I know Chris uh, has been monitoring the Q&A and, um, and also ask some of like the common questions. So, Chris, what do you see? Yeah, thanks, Ken. And and uh, we did have a few questions come in. Again, if there's if there's others out there, please submit via that Q and A box. I'll I'll keep an eye on it here and and pass them along. But you know, one the first one here, and I I think it's uh, a good one. We've you've mentioned a few times it kind of started off in storage, the as a service model. It's moved into compute and data protection and networking and you know, how are how is Insight really helping clients get the right mix of solutions uh, with these with all these different models out there? Do we, do we have any examples of that we could talk to? Well, I mean, we we, we gave an example of a service provider. There's dozens of others of of you know, what are you doing today? What are your thoughts? You know, how you're doing it. But um, you know, those examples are. Um, you know, the, the the clients that are thinking about the networking side, which might be more how do I deal with my remote offices and my um, wide area links and, and things like that versus the data center clients that are saying, should I move this to cloud? Um, but it is just a matter of, you know, as, as you pointed out, it might have started deep storage because that was first. And then they're saying, you know, I can't run, in the case of the service provider, my infrastructure on just storage. You know, I'm going to need compute. I'm going to need these other things to execute my plan. Um, and I think, you know, I think what Phil pointed out was many organizations that were providing infrastructure to clients didn't weren't built to manage it. So they didn't have Phil's organization to say, we'll help manage it as you need, right? And so as a service came as a surprise, um, and the luxury we have, which might be a long answer to your question, is, Everybody who wants to do it as a service is calling us because they know we're one of the few organizations that can provide the service, mix the services up to meet the customer's needs, not necessarily each OEM's needs, and, and make the solution fit what they're trying to accomplish, um, which I think is a benefit over having, you know, name the OEM, but if they come into your office, they've got everything you need. Um, and, and that's not our approach. Our approach is, you know, what is it you need? What are the best of, of breed solutions to meet your needs and, and go from there? Oh, I appreciate that. And then I, I, uh, another good one here, you know, when we talk about these as a service offerings, this isn't a public versus private cloud type of conversation. I, I think the answer is, you know, it plays in kind of both spaces, and it really completes that hybrid cloud model. But would would love to get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I think that was the the big event. That there's a lot of organizations, and they're fairly public, right? That, that says we're just going all cloud. And of course, the industry has been saying for a long time that hybrid the model. But what is hybrid? You know, and now it's just much clearer. That, that hybrid can be a mix of, you know, maybe something isn't going to go to public cloud because it just doesn't make sense. For certain things, I'm going to rush there because I need it to accomplish a very huge initiative, and other things are maybe on this in-between. 
and it, and it really has clarified the landscape that, that it is a hybrid model. I, to answer your question, I can't imagine anybody, you know, significant being all public or all private. It is going to be hybrid. Um, almost everybody's in that environment, and it's going to be a journey, and you don't have to have the answer um, now. You don't have to know the end result today. You just have a plan that is flexible um, as you as you go toward that hybrid model. Yeah, Kent, and I would add to that, you know, I think, you know, that journey that you talk about uh, is key um, in really assessing, it goes back down to your services, your applications, your workloads, and really driving it, it to all of all the clients we talk to is really, we like, I like calling it the and statement. It's the, it's the and. And yes, you're going to want to leverage public cloud for some things. And you're going to want to use hybrid. And you're going to want to use some, some things in, in a dedicated um, environment. Um, and you may want to leverage CapEx. And you may want to leverage out OpEx. Uh, because you have all these options available to you, you can then pick and choose those type of components. And, and really maximize the value that the, um, that these services can, can provide to the business. Uh, but to do that, um, you need to go through a journey of, of assessing those workloads and assessing the assets and the, and the configurations and the requirements of those, assessing you know, things around your network and, and your security profile and, and a lot of things and walk you through that journey uh, with architects and engineers and, and such, and then help help migrate that. That's the part of the journey that you know that we help with with clients all the time, and, and how to you know how to walk them through all the way that and, and into a managed state. Yeah, I mean, I I, I couldn't agree. And, and somebody might hear, I'm going to need all of these things, and say that sounds complicated. Why don't I just go to public cloud? But sometimes, or just tell data center. And at the end of the day, I think so. What we're seeing is doing it or is much more complicated in the long run than doing the end. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I, I think we have time for one more here. Uh, this one a little bit more to the point. Is as a service more or less than CapEx? Ah, really another question. Um, from a pure financial point of view, it's like everything else. It depends. Um, the rule of thumb is if you know you need 100 units of something for five years, then it might be marginally less expensive, probably would be, to buy it. That's true of the house, that you know exactly what you need for a long-term investment. Um, um, however, what we're seeing is, is if you have – variability in your planning, i.e. I'm going to go to cloud, I just go hop fast, um, or, you know, I'm going to grow, or I'm going to shrink. You know, we have lots of clients on as a service that started 100 units and say, allow me to go down to 50. Well, it's a lot more efficient if you, if you have any variability. And so all we would say is we have no problem um, with any client. And in fact, 90% say, what's the CapEx? What's the OPEX? Let me make the right decision for my business. Um, so it, it does depend a little bit, um, but a very, very stable uh, environment probably makes sense. Um, CapEx a little cheaper, might be 20% cheaper. Um, many varying and, and uh, in transitional or transformational environments uh, see benefits in the, in the uh, as a service. Excellent. Well, those those are the questions that have come in so far. Uh, again, I'll, I'll kind of do a last call here and, and see if there's any additional ones, but uh, I think we've covered them all. Well, you know, thank you, um, Bill and and, uh, and Chris, for, for presenting with us. Um, for the clients who, who took a chance to listen live or, or the recording, uh, we appreciate your time. Um, if, if there's something that makes sense to you, and, and you know, some people are going to say this doesn't make sense to me, um, but we are finding people that kind of said, you know, I'll think about it earlier this year, coming back and going, okay, I want to do something. So, you know, at any time where you want more information, that's what we're here to do is provide information that helps you 
plan, your transformation, and your strategy. Um, and um, hopefully you found this valuable. So we want to want to absolutely appreciate your time and um, look forward to talking to you if we get that opportunity. Thank you for attending today's webinar. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available within two to three days. You will receive an email notification once the recording is available. Thanks again for participating and have a good day.